باب المدينة وحامي نبينا باب المدينة وحامي نبينا علي منهج علي تلهج باسمه كملك السماء علي صالة وعلي جالة علي بتار ودماء علي سجدة على خدة للعلي دمع هما علي غيرة وعلي غيرة من كفول فاطمة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد That was not a great salawat I would anticipate a bigger one a louder one Honorable scholars, respected uh, panelists, my dear brothers and sisters, distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to welcome you all, especially those who came from out of town. I would like to welcome you all to Dirbun the capital of Shia Islam in the United States, of the 100,000 people who are residents of Dirbon, there are at least 40,000 Shia Muslims live in this city. So I welcome you on their behalf and I wish you a pleasant stay here in Dirbon, inshallah, and I would love to see you again in the future. I was asked to speak about successful build, community building based on the teachings of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib By the way, my dear brothers and sisters, Imam Ali السلام, and I don't say this because I'm a Shia, it is a reality, it's a powerful reality that Imam Ali السلام, was a man of all fields of knowledge. If you read Nahj al you find this great man giving instructions on certain fields of knowledge as if he is a well specialized in the field. And that's why one great Arab poet, Safi al-Din al-Halli, says about Imam Ali alayhi salam, Jumi'at fi sifatik al-afdadu, falihada azzat lakal andal. You have the ability to possess all fields of knowledge and that's why you have no counterpart. And this is because of the hadith mentioned by my dear brother Samahat al-Shaykh Jihad in which the Prophet sallallahu says Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha I'm the city of knowledge and Imam Ali is the gate and Imam Ali alayhi salam elaborate on that. And he says, علمني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله ألف باب من العلم يفتح لي من كل باب ألف باب ألف باب. He says that the Prophet told me or taught me one thousand, one thousand fields of knowledge. I've been taught by the Holy Prophet in which I can elaborate and extract another one thousand fields. So. Imam Ali alayhi salam is the man of all fields of knowledge. His book Nahj al is a great testimonial on his deep knowledge. Imam Ali alayhi salam says in his last will, in his last wasiyah to his two great sons, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, he says, Wa alaykum bi amrikum. I advise you, I urge you to make sure that you get organized in your community issues. In another hadith, the Imam alayhi salam says, Al-alimu bi zamanih la tajjimu alayhi al-lawabis. A man who is well acquainted with the dynamics of his time, he shall not be overwhelmed with the challenges of his time. So, 
Based on that, my dear brothers and sisters, I believe that there are four great elements of successful building, community building based on the teachings of Imam Ali salam. The first and most important element is education. We Muslims need to emphasize education. We need to encourage our children to go and enroll in the best colleges and universities of this country. The United States has the best colleges and universities around the world. And therefore, for those who chose this country to be their home, I encourage you to send your children to Ivy colleges, to the best colleges of this country. We always complain, how come our cousins have dominated this country and continue to run this country? That's a fact, but that's only part of the fact. The other part is that our cousins made their way to halls of power, not coming off the street, but by graduating from the best colleges and universities of this country. And this should serve as a lesson for us as Muslims, my dear brothers and sisters. Now we have a great lesson on how education can open to you and all aspects of potentials. For example, take Barack Obama as an example. In 2008, the United States made history by choosing the first African-American president. But many of us forgot that Barack Obama was not only black, he graduated from Harvard. And that's a part of his success, that he became the president of this country because he chose to go to the best university, not only in the United States, but in the world, and ultimately that paved the road for him to become the president of the United States. Therefore, I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, education leads to all doors of success. Wealth, power, influence, and fame. And therefore, we have to encourage, we have to constantly encourage our children to go to the best colleges. Here in Dearborn, I ask them, youth, where do you go to? They tell me, we go to Henry Ford. My God, there's no other college you go to other than Henry Ford. Henry Ford is good, but it is not the only college you go to. It is not the best college you go. Go to Ann Arbor, go to Princeton, go to Yale, go to Harvard, go to so many other colleges that can uh, uh, th that you can join and become well educated though Muslims are doing great as far as education but I believe we have a further way to go in 2002 the New York Times released a study indicating that in year 1974 listen to this in year 1974, the number of the Muslim population, student population, in American universities were about 1%, 1% in year 1974. However, in year 2000, the number jumped to 11%. From 1% to 11% in year 2000, the number of the student Muslim population in the United States colleges and universities were 11%. That's a great percentage. And this is something that we aspire to, my dear brothers and sisters. We need to keep encourage our children to go to colleges. You know, it's so, it pains me. It really pains me when I see a young man dropping out of college or school and not going to any college after high school. It really pains me. We have so many opportunities in this country. And you need to seek these opportunities out. So that's a key issue. Speaking of uh, importance of education, 
They say a, a farmer went to an educator to ask him to teach his son, the farmer's son. So the farmer asked the educator how much he would charge for teaching his son. The educator says, I charge 100 dinars. And the farmer says, no, no, that's too much. 100 dinars, too much. I can buy a donkey with 100 dinars. And the educator replied by saying to the farmer, you have two options. It's up to you. You have two options. You can pay me $100 dinars and I can educate your son or you can end up with two donkeys at home. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, this is very important to keep in mind that uh, education is a key success in this country. Also, once we speak about the importance of education, I need to allude to a very important uh, subject that is related to education, and that is Islamic education. If you talk to many of our young brothers and sisters who are going to high school, if you ask them where do you aspire to go after finishing high school, they tell you we want to be, someone says I want to be a doctor, another lawyer, educator, engineer, but you do not hear many of our brothers and sisters interested to become imams and religious leaders. Not many of them are interested in pursuing Islamic education. Why is that? Why is that? You know, in a community without a scholar is a dead community. I was invited a few years ago to a Muslim community here in the United States. I'm not going to mention one. They didn't have an imam. They didn't have a scholar. And they had a funeral. And before I give my eulogy, the son of the deceased, who happened to be Muslim, and the son is presumably Muslim, he stood up on the podium. Remember, this community never had a scholar. It's a Muslim community. They had a masjid, but they never had a scholar. The son of the deceased stood on the podium saying that today I have mixed feelings. Feelings of uh, sadness and jubilation. I'm saddened because of the death of my mother. But I'm jubilant today because today is my wife's birthday. What does this tell you, my dear brothers and sisters? The man was a professor at a university, but it shows the lack of Islamic morality, Islamic education. And that's why we need to emphasize Islamic education in our community. We don't have to always import imams and mashayikh and scholars from the Middle East who do not speak English at all, or if they do, they speak with accent like myself. So, we need to have our own children who go to Najaf and Pong coming back speaking fluent English. We don't need to be to have a mission. One time I was listening to a scholar speaking on the podium before a non-Muslim audience and he wasn't speaking so properly. So every time he wants to say power, he says power. And every time he wanted to say pastor, he said pastor. <laughs> so we need imams and ulama who speak the language properly, including myself, of course. And with no offense to any alim or shaykh. So education is very important. And it's the key to everything, including to halls of power. I remember in 2002, I was invited to the State Department. I sat in the table, dinner table, for a farm with Colin Powell. And there was an interesting conversation between us who were sitting in the conversation on the table and Colin Powell, who was the Secretary of State. I asked Colin Powell, how come we do not have one single Muslim ambassador? There are six million Muslims 
of successful community building, my dear brothers and sisters, is integration. I need to join my voice with my dear brother, Samah Shafiq Jihad. When he said, this is a great country, America is a great country. And imagine if we were in a different country, could we have held this conference with this freedom we are enjoying? America offers a lot to us. And yes, we disagree with American foreign policy, no doubt. We disagree with its policies toward Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Arab-Israeli the Arab conflict. We disagree, strongly disagree with its policies. But the fact remains that the United States of America remains one of the best countries, and if not the best country on earth. I'm not saying it's the holiest country, I'm not saying that, but it is the best country. And the testimony to that is your existence today in the United States. You all came from different countries, Pakistan, India, Iraq, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and many other countries, and you found a great home in this country. Why is it? It is because the United States of America in nature is an Islamic country. You know, there was a big reformist, Sayyid Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, in the year 1860, he traveled to France and UK and to uh, Russia. When he came back, he said, I went to the West. I found Islam, but I did not find Muslims. And when I went back to the Middle East, I found, I found Muslims with no Islam. Are you telling me that the countries in the Middle East are all holding Islamic values. But here in America, if you get sick, you are taken to the emergency room. They don't ask you about your ID, your passport. They treat you, they send you home, then they send you the bill. I know in some Muslim countries, before accepting you into the emergency room, they ask you to deposit $5,000 in their bank account Otherwise, you will be thrown away in the street. In this country, we have social security system in which when you get 60 or 62 year old, the system takes care of you. Do you find this in any Muslim country? In this country, our kids can go to the best colleges and universities and they get financial aid and scholarships. Do you find this in any Muslim country? Therefore, I encourage you to be integrated in this country. I do not mean to be assimilated. Don't get confused. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying we have to be assimilated in this country. What I am saying is that as we keep our Islamic identity too dear to our heart, as, our, as, as we exercise our Islamic rites and rituals, we can also be a great part and parcels of this a great land and this a great nation by being integrated in the bigger society and being part of this community. To some Muslims, America doesn't mean anything. To some Muslim immigrants, America doesn't mean anything but an ATM machine. They come to this country, they make some fortune, and they are planning to go back. And once they go back, they cannot stay there because their children are here and they are torn between their children and their old country and ultimately they choose to come back and stay with their children. So, my dear brothers and sisters, I believe that integration in this system is very essential for us to be a very successful community. And that doesn't mean if we get integrated in this system, we will not be Muslim anymore, or we will be less Muslim. You can practice Islam in this country more than you can practice in any, practice it in any Muslim country. And we have more freedom in this country than Muslim countries themselves. So we have to take advantage of this, my dear brothers and sisters. Number three.
Number three, participation. Number one, we said education. Are you following? Yes. Number two, integration. Number three, participation. We need to participate in order to be a strong community. We have to participate in the political system. There are two ways in America to participate in the political system. In, in the Middle East, there is one way that you grab a tank and you go to the royal palace or the uh, presidential palace, you conduct a coup d'etat and you stay in power. In America, you cannot do that. There are two ways you can be influential in the political life of America. One is by using your own vote, by voting. The majority of Muslims in the past used to refrain from voting. Thinking that it's not going to make any difference. Whether you vote or you don't vote, we're not get anything out of the system. It's a Zionist system. It's anti-Muslim system. That's not true. That's not true at all. Experience proved time, time again, that when we participate, we can change and we can make a big change and we can make a big difference. For example, here in Michigan, we had some interesting experiences with Muslims voting and participating in the political system. So we have now at least three, at least three Shia Muslim judges who are elected by people through their vote where Muslims participated heavily and made a big difference. We have Sister Hajjah Charlene Elder, who is a muhajjaba who put hijab on, and she was elected as the first female Muslim judge in the United States. And she is a practicing Muslim, alhamdulillah. Hajj, they are all practicing Muslims. Hajj David Turfa, he is the second elected Muslim judge. He is a judge here in, in Dearborn Heights. And lastly, Brother Salim Salama, who was elected last August, uh, last uh, November, I'm sorry, as, the, as a, a judge here in Dearborn, and he is a practicing Muslim. And also, we have Brother Abdul Hussein uh, Haydus, who has been elected as the mayor of the city of Wayne here in Michigan. They are all Shia Muslims and they are all practicing Muslims. How? How that was possible? It was possible because the Muslim community here in Michigan participated heavily in the election. And that's how we were able to make a difference. And if we continue, if we continue this progress, my dear brothers and sisters, I assure you, we can have influence on the Congress and the Senate and even at the presidential election as well. All it takes that we become active. How many of you are citizens? Please raise your hand so I, so I can see you. Okay, almost 90% of you. Put your hand down. I want to ask you how many of you are registered voters? Raise your hand. Almost half the number. Almost half the number. Now, if you all become registered voters and you all go to voting booth on the day of election, and it doesn't matter what election, whether it's the state election or the senatorial or the congressional or presidential, when you go on the day of election, you all go with having one, you know, one, we go as one voting block you will make a big difference as Muslims in Michigan made a big difference in the past. The second way to influence, the second way to influence the political system, my dear brothers and sisters, is by contributions. Let me share this story with you. There was a congressman, his name is George Hilliard. George Hilliard, black from Alabama, he was one of few Muslim, one of few congressmen who would defend Muslims at the Congress. One of few. We 
have only three or four congressmen who are sympathetic to Muslims in the Congress of 430 congressmen. George Hilliard was one of them. He was challenged by the Zionist lobby, that was in 2002, who picked an opponent for him who was younger than him, but they poured so much cash to support him. I read in the New York Times that his opponent received 850,000 from the Jewish community in New York. George Hillier, who was intimidated by the, the, the uh, lobby, the other lobby, and who was threatened actually by his opponent, he came to Michigan seeking help from the Muslim community. And there was a fundraising held for him at the Muslim, fellow Muslim's house. <coughs> and the man said, I was there, he said to us, we were maybe 100, 150, he said, if I lose, I'm not going to lose because I have another job offered to me and I can go make a good living. But if I lose, you Muslims will lose because you have only few voices at the Congress. So my fight is your fight, which is true. So help me so I would not be defeated my opponent who is supported by the Zionist lobby. Guess how much money was raised for him? $15,000 versus $850,000. $850, Ultimately, George Hillier was defeated and his opponent took over. This is something that I witnessed myself. So when we contribute, not only participate, we need to contribute for political campaigns, then we can make a bigger difference as well. And finally, my dear brothers and sisters, I believe in order to build a successful community in the United States, we need to believe in the choice of our sisters, the women. We need to empower women in our society. In many Muslim communities around the United States, women are not existing in the leadership level. Why is that? Go to most of our centers, what do you see? You see the main hall is given to the brothers. Women are seated either in the basement or somewhere else where their hall is turned into a babysitting. They have to endure the noise of their kids and they cannot concentrate on the lecture. Yet the brothers are complaining, why don't you keep these kids quiet? As if it's keeping the kids quiet is their responsibility only. Instead of allowing sisters also to be integral part of our communities, we always put them in the back, in an area that is not so clean, dim, with dim lights, not healthy conditions. On top of that, we ask them to handle the task of keeping our kids quiet. That's not right. Imagine the scene of today. We have a sister, outspoken sister, sitting next to two, three panelists, among them some scholars. Would you have ever imagined this happened 20 years ago? But it is happening today. So we have to shift and change the landscape of our Muslim community in which women are empowered and they are given the chance to speak and to represent our community. Remember Fatima al-Zahra salam was not only infallible, she was, salam Allah she was also an, an eloquent speaker. She went to the masjid of her pro, of pro, uh, father, the Prophet sallallahu and she gave a beautiful and powerful sermon before all the muhajireen and ansar and before the uh, uh, Abu Bakr and Umar and all these companions, she did that. And Zainab salam, even though she was overwhelmed with many tragedies, 
the martyrdom of her brother and five of her children and three of her children and many cousins and brothers that did not deter her, deter her from being an eloquent speaker in Kufa and in Damascus in the chamber of Yazid where she delivered a fire speech a fire speech rebuking Yazid for the crimes he committed. We need my dear brothers and sisters, to follow the footsteps of our great models, Fatima al-Zahra salam and Zainab al-Kubra salam We keep talking about Fatima al-Zahra and we keep talking about Zainab salam but we shy away from following them. We need our women not to participate in public life, not to be leaders in our community. All we expect them to cook tandoori as our brother Samat Sheikh Jihad mentioned and biryani and some kubbaniya so our Lebanese brother don't get offended. <laughs> so we need to empower them. We need to have room for our sisters in the community so they can be great speakers for the community. And I tell you From my own experience, every time I saw our sister Hajj Najah, who speaks beautifully and eloquently about Islam, speaking to non-Muslim audience, she they get electrified and mesmerized for seeing a Muslim female speaker speaking to non-Muslim audience. And this is the best testimony, the best proof that Islam is not so is not demeaning toward women as the misconception implies that Muslim Islam does not respect women, they are considered second-hand citizen, and they are not allowed any room in leadership level. So, I believe that we need to have more of Hajj al in our community, more female speakers, more female activists, and I hope, inshallah, we are heading toward that direction. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa